All right, good. Now let's have a word of prayer. Lord, as we get into Joshua chapter 19 and 20 today, Lord, we pray that your spirit would take your word and do that transforming work in your people. Father, I pray that you would captivate our hearts with your word. And Lord, we would leave here differently than we arrived. Lord, I thank you for this, the joy at Calvary Chapel, Pensacola, and this, the grace that is in this place, Lord. But we want to be more like Jesus. We don't simply want to learn more about Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus. So we pray that you would do that good and, 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 and wonderful thing in our midst and, and, and bring us to that full knowledge of the truth today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, bumblebees taste horrible. Um, uh, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, I, but I, because I'm, I'm getting old now, I'm 50, see. If I didn't say that at the beginning, I, 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 that's jogging my memory for something I want to share later on in the teaching. So uh, that, that's just kind of a, a, well, a reminder for me. Joshua chapter 19 and 20 is where we are today. And, and uh, we're going to see more land divisions in, between the tribes. I, I'm giving this tribe the land of the north, and I'm giving this tribe this land over here, and I'm giving this tribe the land on this side of the Jordan and, and on that side of the Jordan. So, so there's just a lot of hard-to-pronounce names in chapters 19 and 20, just as we've seen in the previous weeks. And I'm not going to read those names um, for you. You can read that. That's your homework. Go home and read all those difficult names and Land divisions, but I do want to camp out for just a second on verses 49 through 51 of Joshua chapter 19. And if you're visiting with us at uh, Calvary Chapel, we teach verse by verse through God's Word. Um, Joshua 19, verse 49 When they had made an end of dividing the land as an inheritance according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua the son of Nun. And according to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for, Timnath Sarah, in the mountains of Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt in it. And these were the inheritances which Eleazar the priest, uh, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided as an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting, so they made an end of dividing the country. And as we've seen in previous Bible studies, God gave them this, this huge, vast area of land, and they have to this day yet to take possession of all the land that God gave to them. And it's an exciting time that we're living in. I hope you'll come to our Revelation study on Wednesday night, because the things that are happening in the Middle East, the signs of the times, it's just amazing the time that we're living in. But they've got all this land that's been given out to everybody. And note with me in these verses that I've read, Joshua received his inheritance after everyone else. After everyone else. And, and, and this is going along with a New Testament teaching of Christ. Jesus taught his disciples something that we at Calvary Chapel call servant leadership. And you say, what's servant leadership? Well, this is the way Jesus stated it. He said, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, or they're bossy, right? And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And that Greek word is doulos. It means slave, a slave by choice. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Servant leadership. I want you to think about what a servant was in that day. Servants weren't thanked for serving. They weren't asked nicely to serve, right? If, they, if you're running low on something at the table and you've got dinner guests, you would look over the servant and say, we need more wine. We need more bread. We need more soup. We need more whatever. And they didn't ask nicely. 
They gave orders and servants jumped. They moved quickly, right? They weren't thanked. They weren't asked nicely. And, and we're called, all of us, to serve one another, right? Say amen if you're listening to that. Amen. Now, you know you have a servant's heart when somebody treats you like a servant and you don't get angry about it. See, we think, we think of ourselves as servants, but we, we're, most of the time we're not really servants, right? Because somebody tells us, if they don't ask us nicely, then we get all bent out of shape. Well, who do you think you are? Don't you know who I am? And I don't have to do that, and, right? I even thought about asking some people to go pick up trash outside uh, before the service this morning to prove the point, see who I could get bent out of shape <laughs> by just ordering them around. You know, I thought, well, I don't want to set someone up like that. If I was set up, I'd, I'd fail the test too, right? But servants, that's what Jesus said he needs in the church. That's what we see modeled in the book of Joshua. Everybody got their land, and after everybody else was taken care of, then it was time for Joshua to get a portion of land. At Calvary Chapel, we believe that leaders exist to care for the church, not the church exists to care for the leaders. It's a fundamental difference in our philosophy of ministry from other uh, ministries out there. You know, we've gone through, I've been here about four years now, we, you know, there was a huge turnover of people from the old you know, regime and the last chapter to what all, how many of you have been here less time than me? Raise your hand. There's a lot of new, a lot of new people here at, at Calvary Chapel. And when people left, you know, our giving shrunk down to nothing, you know, and it wasn't that people left angry as I'm taking my money. And, uh, it wasn't that. They just felt like God, they'd served their time here and God called them to a different place. And, and we went through a real budget crunch. And the first thing that took place was that I withheld my paychecks from being paid. I mean, there wasn't money to be paid, but I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to cut missionaries. We have never failed to pay missionaries as far as I understand, but there have been times where I was holding two or three months paychecks, uh, you know, and just living off of savings and those kinds of things. And I don't share that with you to go, oh, poor Pastor Philip. That's not why I share such a thing. I'm sharing it with you because it is modeling for God's people that the church doesn't exist to care for me. I exist to care for you. And it's an important thing for us to grow into together. There's some of you that feel called to ministry. And listen, if you feel called to ministry, it is a sacrificial thing in which sometimes your needs go unmet because you're meeting the needs of others. And this is what Jesus modeled. You know, he washed the disciples' feet and, 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 and all of this. And that's what we're called to, to be like. Joshua was last to get his land after everyone else got theirs. I've been in the ministry now for almost 20 years. I'm a pastor's son, which means I've been in the church, backstage pass, behind the curtain in ministry most of my life. And I've seen it from every possible angle that you can see ministry. And while I'd like to tell you that Calvary Chapel is, is, is far better and different than every other movement of God and all of this, the churches are churches, right? I mean, we, we have all kind of, basically the same kind of problems is what I'm stating. And I've noticed that there are these two extremes in churches today, at least in American Christianity. I, and, and, and I think American Christianity is odd compared to what's going on like in the house church movement of China or the Russian churches, you know, where they have eight or ten people after 20 years of ministry meeting in a living room, you know. I mean, we, we, there's so many things that we think we have to have to be church in America, right? So in the American way of thinking of church, these are the two extremes that I have noted over all these years. Celebrity pastors and janitor pastors. Celebrity pastors and janitor pastors. And, and before I explain what I mean by these, I want you to know I don't feel like I am either one of these extremes at this time. I don't, okay? So don't, don't, don't get your defenses up like I'm about to take some jabs at you. I'm really not. Um, l larger churches make a celebrity of the pastor. I mean, they really do. Whether they mean to, whether it's intentional, uh, it, it, it just happens because I guess there's so many people. And how do you know if you're a celebrity pastor? Well, if, if people pay you to go on a, cru uh, to go on a cruise with you, uh, you're a celebrity pastor, okay? If, if, if you have a four-color glossy uh, photo shoot, uh, several of those a year with your picture, uh, you know, and you know how to pose for the camera... <laughs> 
right? That, you're a celebrity pastor, okay? If you have bouncers or handlers that keep the people from getting too close to you, because you've got 19 services this weekend, and we've got to get him, uh, we've got code blue, we've got to get him from point A to point B. Uh, keep Miss Annie away from him. Keep, keep him moving, right? If you've got bouncers and handlers, you're a celebrity pastor. If you write books uh, or sign people's Bibles at the end of the service, I have always thought, man, what's up with that? I mean, what pastor has the the nerve to sign a Bible. It's like, it's like he didn't write it, right? But if you ask me to sign, sign your Bible, I'm going to say, I did not write this. I don't know why you're having me sign it, but I love you. And please don't make a celebrity pastor of me. I don't want to get struck by lightning, right? If you speak at conferences and you miss a lot of Sundays at the church that you're actually called to pastor, you're a celebrity pastor. If you pastor the staff and the staff pastors the people, you're a celebrity pastor. If you pick your wardrobe based on what will look good on camera, I've got to have this kind of background and I've got to wear black because that's really good, right? That's a celebrity pastor, right? If people are in awe of you, compliment you regularly. See, I get heckled in this church. <laughs> I don't get a lot of compliments. I actually get heckled. <laughs> I thick skin, is right? Uh, but see, look, I'm only 30 years old, and look at how old I look. <laughs> I'm saying ministry, I've taken a beating from ministry. Oh. I'm just kidding. Poor baby. <laughs> if people say, poor baby, you're not a celebrity pastor. <laughs> if people compliment you and you believe the compliments, you're a celebrity pastor. <laughs> Brother, you're just so awesome. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> and we need more pastors like me, God. Right? That's a celebrity pastor. If you've never cleaned a toilet or changed a light bulb at the church facilities, campus, whatever you want to call your buildings, right? You're a celebrity pastor. I mean, celebrity pastors, these guys, the, the church exists to give that pastor a platform, right? Now, that's one extreme what we see in America. And then the other uh, extreme is the janitor pastor. And so what is the janitor pastor? Well, Janitors are paid to clean up other people's messes, and they're paid very little at that, right? I mean, think about a, a, a janitor at the mall or the school. These are kind of invisible people, right? I mean, you kind of notice them, but you don't really want to notice them. You don't want to know that, oh, I'm sorry, you have to clean up this cafeteria. And, hey, how are you? You point at you. And, 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 and so uh, if the celebrity pastor has to learn to cope with prosperity and adulation, right, you're just being complimented and noticed all the time. The janitor pastor has got to learn to cope with poverty and obscurity. They don't have enough, and nobody even knows how much they're struggling out there, Right? And again, they're paid as little as possible to do the job that nobody else wants to do. And the majority of churches worldwide in any denomination or movement operate under this model. This is, this is the other extreme, and it's just as unhealthy and extreme as, as the celebrity pastor thing is. And it isn't that the pastor is expected to do everything. All too often, it, it, you know, it, it, it's the people not doing the basic stuff because they just don't even think about it. And so the pastor tries to pick up the slack, and what he can't do, his poor wife is trying to compensate for it because, I mean, this is his job, and, uh, you know, if he's not it affects all the whole family and what they can't do the pastor's kids are vol the volunteer to do this right that's why when you know somebody takes their kids out to the foyer area and just lets them run and I see one of my daughters back there I gotta tell you that really chafes against me because my kids need to be in here listening to teaching and if anybody can afford to miss the teaching it's mature Christians that have been sitting under the word a while we don't want kids out there watching the kids right and listen, the, my, the kids love to go out there and watch the kids because they don't want to listen to me. I, I, yeah. I get that, right? Uh, um, janitor pastors, they, uh, well, they, they, they clean the church, they change the light bulbs, they cut the grass, they trim the hedges. Uh, uh, janitor pastors financially struggle. I mean, they barely eke by from year 
to year. I mean, they're just, it, it's, it's, it's a pitiful kind of a thing. Uh, years ago, we had a pastor and wife kind of weekend thing at Calvary Chapel Chattanooga. Remember that, Tam? And, 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 and so we're getting together with all the Tennessee Calvary Chapel pastors and wives and everything. We had a great time of fellowship. But, you know, you could tell the churches that were janitor, pastor kind of model because they just looked so haggard. I mean, just the wives and the husbands just looked wore out. I mean, just whooped, just just beaten down. by. They're just trying to do everything, you know. Uh, they're just struggling. Janitor pastor churches attract a lot of dysfunctional, emotionally unhealthy people. What? Oh, yeah, those big churches, they don't have time for folks that have problems quite often. Now, that's a general statement, but there's a lot of truth in it, Okay. But small churches seem to be the place where the dysfunctional and the very, really unhealthy people kind of come in and they can get some personal care and attention. And because the janitor pastor is counseling more than studying, the people never actually become healthy spiritually. You see, it's kind of set against itself. It's set against itself. The church that I left back in Tennessee, the pastor that I handed things off to, he's very strong in pastoral care. I mean, it just feeds his soul to sit and listen to people, you know, share their problems and share their problems and share their problems. And my concern, and I've shared this with him before, is you can allow all of that, which is so validating, feels good to you, to rob you of your study time, and you'd better get in God's Word so that you can teach God's people. Otherwise, they won't become healthy. They won't outgrow some of this dysfunctional kind of a, a stuff. Uh, again, what is a janitor? A janitor is somebody that's played, paid to clean up other people's messes. Quite often, people will come to me for counseling. And it's like they, they did 20 years of damage to their life, and now they're on this cliff, this, this ledge. They're about to jump, and they want me to fix in an hour counseling session what has taken them 20 years to, and I, I, I'll listen, I'll pray with you, I'll, 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 I'll give you God's word to the best of my ability. But there are no quick fixes in life, are there? And, and, and so, you know, sometimes people want me to clean up the mess that they... I Listen, I'm still trying to clean up my own mess in my own life, right? I mean, that's what we're all kind of trying to do. Janitor pastors look more like servant leaders... But the best way to serve the people and lead the people is by ensuring that they are the best fed and the most loved sheep in the community. Guys, that's the, the best thing I can do for you is lock myself in my office for 30 hours a week, 40, however many hours I can get, and study and study and study and study and study, right? It's the best thing that a pastor can do. Why? Ephesians says that he has called pastors to equip God's people for the work of ministry till we all come to this unity of the faith and knowledge of the truth. So the church becomes healthy when I'm doing the thing that I'm supposed to do. And again, let me say it. I don't feel that I'm pastoring this extreme either. I, do, I don't. And why are we talking about uncomfortable stuff like this? Do I just have a chip on my shoulder and want to take a jab at the big, you know, or the, that, that's not it at all, guys. The reason we have these two extremes is because people, pastors, are afraid to teach a balanced, better way. And when you teach through the Bible like we're doing here, you come to a verse like uh, verse 50, you know, uh, after everyone, 49 through 51, after everybody else got their land, Joshua got his land and, and all. And see, so when you come to that, it's like, okay, the Lord is saying, all right, it's uncomfortable. You don't like talking about it, Pastor, and the people probably don't like hearing about it. But it has to be said. You've got to get this stuff out there so we can have a balanced model. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for. They gave him what he asked for. And so what is the balanced pastoral model? The pastor should be paid enough to support his family and spend the majority of his time in study of God's word. He should only do what only he can do. And let others do the stuff that, he, that they can't do, right? I mean, you can't lock yourself away for 30 hours a week and study. That's something only I can do. That's what God has called and gifted me to do. But there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. I, you know, we, and there are servants around here that just do, that. they go way above and beyond. 
Now the tragedy though is it's still, it's still 10% of the people doing 90% of the work. And that's not the healthy model. That's not what, what God wants of the church. I, that, you know, these two extremes, we don't want to be either one of those. So um, note that the people obeyed the word of the Lord and they gave him the city, but Joshua had to ask for it. Did you notice that in the text? Look, look, look with me again. Verse 50, according to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for. Joshua actually stood up before the people and said, all right, everybody's got a you know, nice little plot of land. This is what I'd like. And, and the reason that is something that we need to, to, to put, shed some light on is because some of the janitor pastors that I have known in these years of ministry, they're in a struggling situation because they won't ask. They won't, they won't even make the people aware of how they're struggling. Now, they'll tell the Lord, but they won't actually come before the people and say, guys, listen, I just can't make it on this salary, and my wife can't do this any longer, and I, I need, we need some help. See, there's a, there's a, there's a humbling thing in, in, in coming before God's people and sharing these things with them. And the Lord told the people, uh, you know, you all have yours. Go ask him what he needs to live a decent quality of life. And he told them, he said, well, this is the land that I want, the city over here. And you don't have to make it awkward. Listen, I'm, this is not so much for us, because I'm a confrontational, uh, kind of relaxed alpha male. I'll tell you. I mean, you know I'll tell you, right? Um, but I share this teaching because there are folks all around the world that watch this teaching on the Internet. And there are pastors that are struggling out there. And this is a word for some of them. You need Pastors, you need to tell your people if you're struggling. You need to just be honest with them about these things. You see, God's called me to not live a life of poverty, nor has he called me to live a life of celebrity prosperity. I'm supposed to live this balanced kind of a moderate life, and you're supposed to be able to look at my life and say, you know what, that looks like a pretty good life. It's a pretty good life. He's not getting rich off the ministry, but he lives within his means. He pays his bills on time. He saves his money. And, and, and wow, that, and they look really happy. That's, you see, I'm supposed to be modeling for you a better way. Quite often there are pastors that are workaholics. They neglect their family, not because God told them to, but because they're just imbalanced. They don't know how to juggle all of these things. So, yeah, you know, if there are church people from other churches watching this, don't make it awkward on your guy. Don't put him on the spot. You know, best thing that you can do is give generously to the local church and then serve regularly. I mean, that's really the best thing that everybody can do. Quit asking, what are, Pastor, are you okay? Just give. If you give, I mean, I forget the percentage of people that give in the local church, but it's not even half of the people that are giving faithfully and regularly. If you just gave faithfully and regularly, everybody would be okay in every church, everywhere. I mean, there are exceptions, I'm sure, to this. Now that we've dealt with that uncomfortable, awkward thing, here's what I'd like you to do. Everybody stand to your feet and, and change seats. Move to the other side of the room. Uh, uh, just get, get the blood flowing. Everybody stand up, stretch those legs, and move, because now we're going on to something less uncomfortable for all of us to talk about. <clears throat> Excellent. There you go. <laughs> Clearly, this is not a Baptist church like my upbringing because everyone's on the front row now. This is awesome. Yeah. Now, uh, there are a couple of you <clears throat> that are rebels. You're like, I'm not getting up and changing seats. Can I tell you, I really like you guys because that, that's exactly what I would do. I'm not getting up. I like my seat. I'm, I'm staying right where I was sitting. You're not the boss of me. I'm going to stay right where I was. <laughs> That's right. You, you're exempt. Slater right here is exempt. Chapter 20, it's just a little nine-verse chapter, and, and, and this, is, you know, this is the part that I'm, I was looking forward to teaching. You know, the first part was like, Ugh, let's get on through that, and let's get to this now. Chapter 20 of Joshua, 
the Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge. Everyone say cities of refuge. Cities of refuge. Very good. Of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and, and, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally but did not hate him before. Everyone say hate. hate. Very good. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. And then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. So they appointed Kedesh in Galilee in the mountains of Naphtali and Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness on the plain and from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth and Gilead and from the tribe of Gad and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh, and these were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now, if you think I'm good looking, say amen. Amen. <laughs> you aren't listening. I got you. Uh, you're so used to me saying if you're listening, say amen, right? You didn't. You don't, you don't think I'm good looking? Thank you, Scott. It's a good right hand man right there. Now, uh, cities of refuge. Let's talk about cities of res refuge. Okay, it was the custom at this time to demand equal punishment for a crime. We all know eye for an eye, right? Everyone say eye for an eye. Okay, eye for an eye, life for a life. That was the. But there's a misunderstanding about this law. There are people that think, well, you know, if you blacked my eye, uh, the law obligates me to go and pop you in the eye and black your eye back, right? And eye for an eye, like it's something that you have to do. And that's really not what eye for an eye um, type of justice was all about. You didn't have to retaliate. The law ensured that you did no more than was done to you. That's what eye for an eye is really about. See, when I was a kid, if somebody hit me in the eye, I wanted to break their nose. I don't want to do to you what you did to me. I want to do to you the same and a little more, right? And then he hits me, and I'm going to do a little bit more to you. And before you know it, I mean, it's a throw-down serious deal, right? Now, this eye for an eye type of justice said, hey, wait a minute here. If somebody pops you, you can pop them back. But you can't go above and beyond what they did to you. And that's important for us to note because I don't want you to get it in your head that God wants us to retaliate. He, he really doesn't. I don't think that's the best way uh, quite often. Um, but, but what this is talking about in chapter 20 is, well, let's say that, that, that you, me and, and, and you were chopping wood and the axe head flew off of my axe and, and you were accidentally killed. Well, the nearest male relative of yours could kill me as the avenger of blood. In fact, it was his duty to do so. Duty to do so. Well, how, how was accidental death determined? Look at verse 5. Then the avenger of blood pursues him. They shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally but did not hate him beforehand. So hate is the key to all of this. That's how they determined then. Quite often I think that's the way things are determined today. And you know, this is a, a kind of an interesting thing for me in my personal background, because in 1 John, that's, I was reading that when I had hatred for my foster brother. I got in a fight with him, got sent to my room. I was waiting for a spanking when my mom and dad were coming home from dinner with friends. And I thought, well, I'll read my Bible to maybe get out of a spanking. 
And I opened my Bible. It was a living Bible I'd received for Christmas the year before. And it fell open to 1 John. And I started reading there. And it said, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I realized my hatred revealed I wasn't really a Christian. I read on and it said, if anyone says I love God but keeps on hating his brother, he's a liar. For if he doesn't love his brother who's right in front of him, how can he love God whom he's never seen? See, hatred tells the truth about things. If you have hatred for somebody, that reveals you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Because he who is forgiven forgives. Now that's a principle all throughout the New Testament teaching. I remember a lady coming to me years ago. She had just been so mistreated by her, her ex-husband, you know. And uh, she said, I'm thinking about becoming a nun. And I said, well, why do you want to become a nun? I, I'd never met anyone that wanted to be a nun before. And she said, I want to be a nun. And I said, well, what's, you know, what's motivating that? You want to serve God with all your... She said, no, I absolutely hate men. I hate all men because of what was done to me. I just hate every man. I don't want to be around men. I just want to get away in a monastery with just other women. And I said, well, listen, you know, you're not a candidate to be serving the Lord in that capacity because your hatred reveals you don't have that beginning relationship with Jesus Christ. Whew, she got mad. Of course, I'm a guy, so she hated me from the get-go. I, mean, I didn't have anything to lose. I tell her the truth, right? But listen, when you have hatred, hatred reveals something, doesn't it? In the Old Testament, hatred made the, the accidental, you know, the, the axe head flying off the... Uh, well, that doesn't look like an accident there, because we know that you really hated Miss Annie, Pastor Philip, and you swung that axe and took her out, and right? She knows I'm kidding. You're one of my favorite people. You know that. I just want to ask you today, do you have hatred in your heart? If you do, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. And I'm telling you that when you acknowledge your hatred, your sin, that you do not have that beginning relationship with Jesus Christ, and you confess that and ask the Lord to save you, I'm telling you, you'll never deal with hatred again. My life bears witness to that. Because after I accepted Christ, there in my bedroom with my dad praying with me that night. I never had hatred of my foster brothers and sisters again after that. I've never hated anybody. In fact, I see the terrible things that people like ISIS and all these folks are doing, and I think, Lord, they need Jesus. That they, and you died for them too, Lord, right? He didn't just die for you good, decent church folks. You understand that, don't you? He died for every other rotten person like you and me. I mean, we're all rotten. All of us like sheep have gone astray. That's right. So uh, if someone unintentionally, you know, does this thing, they go to one of these cities of refuge and they go to the entrance at the gate, that's where the cases were heard. It was the ancient equivalent to a courtroom. And you were safe while you lived in the city of refuge. But once the high priest died, the offender was released to go home. It's like, okay, yeah, it's, it's, you've served your time. You can go back to your hometown and you're safe from that point on. And, and that's a picture of Jesus. He is our high priest, isn't he? His death on the cross released us from our sin so that we could go to our heavenly home one day. But Jesus is not only the high priest in chapter 20. He is, in fact, the city of refuge. He is the one that we can run to and find safety. And in verses 7 through 9, we have the names of these you know, cities of refuge. I'm not going to read them again to you. But there were six of them. Three to the east of the Jordan. Three to the west of the Jordan. Uh, th there were three. Uh, lo uh, there was one located north. There was one located central region. One located in the south. In other words, God set this up so the little state of Israel, no matter where you are in the, in, in the, in the state of Israel, if you really hoof it, you know, if you really run, you're half a day away from any city of refuge. God made it so anybody could get to a city of refuge that, that had unintentionally or accidentally, you know, taken a life. And once you got into the city, you were safe. You were safe. Now, bumblebees taste horrible. Now, here's how I know this. When I was about nine years old, my foster brother, Walter, we called him King Edward. That was his middle name, Edward, King Edward. 
probably didn't pronounce the R, King Edward and me, we found some bumblebees in this log down by our property. And, and we decided we're going to shoot the bumblebees with our BB guns. And so we got some old screen doors we found in a dumpster, and we, wrapped, we knocked the screens out, and we wrapped those around our legs and duct taped them, and we put on our winter coats. It was this summer, right? And uh, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, you know, with our Red Rider BB guns, and we're going we're gonna to try and shoot bumblebees. Now, I, I don't know whose idea this was. I'm going to blame it on King Edward. It's probably mine. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you know, if you've ever shot a Red Rider BB gun, you know, the B, you can see the BB going. <laughs> it's like it's so slow. And we, could, we couldn't hit them. So we get, kept getting closer and closer and closer until we're right on top of this log, you know, with our BB guns shooting into this knot, you know, in the, in the log. And, man, we finally hit a bumblebee. And, listen, the carpenter bees in Florida, they look scary, but they're not. They're nothing to fret over. A bumblebee from Tennessee, I'm telling you, that is an aggressive insect, right? And so we, we finally shoot the bumblebees, and they swarm. And King Edward and I, we're running and flailing and swinging and screaming, ah, you know, running. And, 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 and as I'm running away from this log and everything, my mouth is open, ah, it goes right in my mouth. And it was just an instinct that I bit down on the bumblebee, after he stung me, and my jaw was swelling up, that's how I know the bumblebees taste horrible. He said, now, what, now why in the world are you telling a story like that? I woke up this morning thinking about the bumblebee incident because my, our older brother Stan, we called him Stan the Man. He heard all the flailing. I don't know where he came from, but he came from like out of nowhere. And we had already been shedding our winter coats because they you know, there's something about a bumblebee. They get in their collar and then they're ah, you're coming out of your clothes in this field. And Stan is taking one of the coats on the ground and he's swatting at these bumblebees. I mean, he's he was a tennis player, got a college scholarship for tennis. And he's swatting these bumblebees with his coat and everything. And then and I finally got out a safe distance away and I looked over and there's King Edward, my little brother, and he's rolling on the ground and Stan gets that coat and jumps on top of King Edward, and he's patting him down like he's on fire. And, 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 and I was thinking of that story this morning. I was thinking, the Lord Jesus, that's kind of the way he is with us. We get into sin. We get into all these messes in life, right? And, we get, and, and because we're doing things we ought not be doing, all of a sudden we've got bumblebees just swarming. And just like my brother Stan, Jesus runs over and drapes himself over to protect. He's not afraid of getting stung. He'll take the sting to keep you from getting stung, see? Swatting those bumblebees away. Uh, it, it, being stung to keep us from being stung. That is a picture of what Jesus is in, in this city of refuge. No matter what you've done, if you run, you can get to the city of refuge. And once you're there, nobody can touch you. And some of you today need to hear this. You, you, you say you're forgiven, you pray you're forgiven, but you don't own those words. You know what I mean? You still think that your performance is the reason God likes you. Well, I read my Bible this week, and I went to church every Sunday for a month, and so God must really like me this month, right? It has nothing to do with your performance. He loves you because He is your city of refuge. No matter what kind of a foolish, crazy thing you get yourself into with bumblebees, He'll be there to pat you down, get the harm away, and make sure you're all right. And some of you need to come running back to Jesus today. As I was thinking about that story in my childhood, I was thinking, we weren't running towards Stan. We were just running away from bumblebees. And because he wanted to look out for his little brothers, he chased us down and, and, and just draped himself over us to protect us from being stung. And what a cool older brother, right? Now why in the world did something like that happen? Well, the Lord knew 20-something, 30-something, 40-something, however many years later... Pastor Philip would be saying, hey, 
you're not even running towards Jesus, some of you. You're just running from bumblebees. And the Lord Jesus is chasing you down to drape himself over you so that you won't get stung anymore. Now, are you tired of being stung? I mean, are you tired of reaping what you're sowing from the foolish enterprises of life? Right? I'm telling you, we all do something crazy at one time or another. We end up getting stung, right? Are you tired of being stung? Jesus says, I will drape myself over you. I will rescue you from everything you've gotten yourself into. He is not the kind of Lord that says, well, you shouldn't have stirred up those bumblebees. Uh, three or four good stings will teach you a lesson. That's the kind of thinking we have about, that's not the way the Lord is. The Lord says, well, that's just like you to try and shoot a bumblebee, Philip. And it grieves me that you got stung on the inside of your mouth. But I'm here. And I'll let him sting me from this point on. So you learn never to do that again. I'd like you to bow your heads. Jesus is your city of refuge. Some of you need to run to him today. You just need to run to Jesus. The best way to keep from getting into trouble is to run to Jesus. And by the way, when you begin running to Him, you'll realize He's been chasing after you all along. He's been one foot behind you, trying to protect you from harm and from pain. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to ask yourself one of those tough questions. God, where do I stand with you? Do I have hatred in my heart? Am I not a follower of Jesus? Some of you need to come to Christ and give Him your life today. There are others of you who keep getting yourself into trouble. You need to run to the city of refuge. You need to run to Jesus. He's your high priest. And you need to run to Him to find safety in the storm. Others of you, you've, you know, we haven't seen you in a while. And the church, well, this is heaven's embassy. And I'll tell you, the more often you're in this place, the less often you're going to get stung by something out there in the world. And some of you may need to recommit to being in the city of refuge called the church. As Calvin plays this morning, this is your opportunity to deal with these matters. Some of you may need to come down to the front and get on your knees and pray to God. Others of you may need to go to someone in this room and talk some things out with them. I'll be at the back of the room if you need to pray with Pastor Philip this morning. <clears throat> but do business with God today. Make your life right with Him today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. And then once everybody is confessed up and They've re-surrendered their lives as much as they know how to do. Then you come down to the front with a friend and take the Lord's Supper together. One of you just lead in prayer, thanking the Lord for His body and His blood, which has washed us white as snow. Then after we take the Lord's Supper, that's a kind of our decision time, the Lord's Supper. Then you make your way back to your seat and we'll have a closing worship chorus. But I'm going to lead us in prayer. 
and then I'll be at the back of the room and you come back if you need to talk with me. Lord, we love you. We thank